welcome everyone and thank you for joining this revegetation webinar. The webinar is funded by Hunter Local Land Services bringing back the Regent Honey Eater Program through the Australian Government's National Land Care Program. So now I'd like to introduce Christy Peters, the New South Wales Woodland Bird Project Officer for Bird Life Australia, who's going to talk about the importance of vegetation for woodland birds and the 2021 Regent Honey Eater Captive release. Thanks, Christy. Thanks, Carolyn. Thanks for that intro. Um, yes, I'm part of Bird Life Australia's Woodland Bird Program. Um, the purpose of our team is to address current and long lasting threats to woodland bird declines. And we currently have six staff in New South Wales and we're based mainly around the Lower Hunter. I'm based in Gloucester and some of my other teammates are, are based in the Newcastle area. And then we also have a couple of staff members in the Cowra area. So the Woodland Birds Program, the aim of it is to reverse the decline of our woodland bird species. Kath's just putting up some slides. Thank you, Kath. So the key action um, that our team works toward is, is the, the actions in our conservation action plan, which is like a recovery plan that people might be familiar with for a single species, but this is for all of our woodland bird species. So as um, Carolyn mentioned, our flagships are the Regent Honey Eater and the Swift Parrot. So the flagship species are a charismatic animal that we identify to help us raise awareness about the urgent need for action and funding around certain conservation issues. And in this case, it's all of these threatened woodland bird species and 28 of which um, Carolyn showed on that beautiful poster are threatened in our region. So I'll go to the next slide. Thanks, Kath. So in, in the Lower Hunter and in the other areas that many of, of the listeners today are, are calling in from, um, we have along the coast forests which actually function as woodland bird habitat, but not all forests are what we would consider woodland. They don't have um, the same structure. A lot of the forests are quite dense, um, lots of shrubs, quite a dense understory. So our woodland birds don't typically like that kind of structure. They're after um, more of an open understory, lots of leaf litter on the ground, and they want lots of diverse foraging areas. So I just encourage people when you're planning your reveg project to think about some of these, these things that uh, woodland birds need for their survival. They love having a mix of clumps of dense shrubby species so they could, little birds like to go into those to hide from predators but they also like places to perch and to preen. And our insect and seed eaters like having areas of open grassy understory. You also should look at including a high diversity of species in the canopy and shrub layer, and that'll give you a diverse range of nectar and, and fruit producing species that will sort of fruit and flower throughout the year. And also consider um, plants that will drop a lot of leaf litter, like some of our acacias and she oaks um, that'll encourage that ground litter accumulation and you'll get lots of insects and reptile prey move in and then you'll get lots of our threatened woodland birds and, and some of our more common species coming in for that those types of prey items. Thanks, Kath. Yeah, but unfortunately we've we've lost a lot of this temperate woodland along the southeast of Australia. Up to 85% of it has now been cleared. And what remains is, is highly modified and fragmented. And it's now mo one of the most threatened ecosystems in Australia. Just jump to that next one. So just showing here, this map is just showing the change in woody vegetation. So the green in the, in, across the countries where there's been no change in, in habitat uh, for our woodland bird and forest species, but the orange is where there has been a change from forest to non-forest. So you can see there, the change is quite consi uh, considerable, the loss in New South Wales and Victoria and South Australia particularly. And that's why we have so many of our threatened woodland birds that um, you know their distribution occurs in those three states because we've lost so much of that habitat. And this is just a little snapshot of some of the, the different species of woodland birds you might find. 
throughout the region. There's a little southern white face, uh, um, Fuscus honeyeater, black chinned honeyeater, and a couple of threatened species down the bottom left, the little um, flame robin and um, turquoise parrot down the bottom. So a real diversity of species, around 250 to 300 species of birds use our temperate woodlands, and many of them only use this kind of habitat. They're what we call obligate species. So they just can't use the um, more sort of open structure of paddock trees and grassy understory. Um, they can't use the denser structure of our forests that have lots of shrub and vine layer. They really need a more sort of open uh, structure with just sort of small clumps of shrubs, um, you know, some taller canopy species, but generally some open areas where they can come down and forage on their insect prey. And our most threatened woodland birds, as Caroline men uh, Carolyn mentioned before, are the Regent Honeyeater and the Swift Parrot. So the stunning Regent Honeyeater is a nomadic woodland bird species, and it roams really widely across southeastern Australia. And it's in search of its favourite flowering eucalypt species and also mistletoe blossom. And then we have the small and equally stunning migratory swift parrot. Um, that species there breeds in Tasmania and in the spring and summer, and then it migrates across Bass Strait to the Australian mainland, and it spends the autumn winter feeding in the inland box ironbark woodlands and the coastal spotagum ironbark forests, and also the red gum and bloodwood forests. And both these species are quite picky in the in the um, eucalypt species that they are after. They're after particular ones. So I've just got a list there of some of the trees that are important for these species. Spotted gum, broad-leaved ironbark, thin-leaved stringy bark, lots of our box species like grey box and then the yellow box and white box in the upper hunter regions. And then also coastal things like forest red gum, grey gum, uh, red bloodwood. And mistletoes are also quite important for Regent honey eaters, which I'll mention in another slide. But um, while these are very important for those species, just remember that when you plant, you're planning your reveg project, just to consult the experts about what's local to your area, because those are going to be the species that your local, your local birds are, are actually after. They're going to suit the conditions best. So just remember that when you're planning your project. So mistletoes, we've actually got almost 100 native mistletoe species across Australia and quite a few of those occur around the, the Hunter region and the Manning region. Um, you know, we've got this beautiful species here called the long ploughed mistletoe, which you may actually see in blossom right now. And as you can see from these photos, the Regent honey eater not only uses it to forage in, they love the sugary nectar, but they also love to make their nests in the dense clumps. And those dense clumps, we've, we've sort of been discovering more and more, uh, BirdLife Australia and university researchers have been recording quite a few Regent honey eaters using these dense clumps to build their nest in. And the other thing I just wanted to mention is just how important the Hunter Valley is for Regent honey eaters. It's one of their key breeding areas, as Carolyn mentioned. And um, last year we had our first Regent honey eater release in New South Wales. And we've been able to follow that up this year with a second release, a much larger release of birds in the lower Hunter Valley. So, uh, sorry, just one second. Let's get through to my notes. So I hope that you may have seen in the media, some of the, um, the media that's come out lately about the, this latest release into the Curry Cessnock wet woodlands, which occurred last month. So this is just a photo of some of the birds that were bred at Taronga Zoo. Um, both the Sydney Zoo and the Western Plains Zoo were involved in breeding birds this year. And they're here in their holding tent with their coloured leg bands waiting to be released. All the birds get fitted with a special combination of leg bands, coloured leg bands, so that we can identify them once they've been released. And many birds, like the one in the bottom right corner, also fitted with a radio transmitter. You can see that um, radio transmitter cord, the antenna, coming off the bird's back um, so that we can track their movements across the landscape. So we released 58 birds, um, 30 are wearing radio transmitters currently. And this was very significant because it was on Aboriginal land. It occurred on land owned by Mindaribba Local Aboriginal Land Council. And you can see their CEO down the bottom there, Tara Diva, wearing her people's possum skin cloak at the, the ceremony to release the birds. 
And we just thank all of the people that have and organisations involved, like Hunter LLS and um, the other ones listed there. It's a big collaborative effort to get this sort of project off the ground. Thanks, Gam. So we've got a monitoring team out at the moment working hard. They're monitoring the birds for people seven days a week. Um, yeah, definitely no weekends off for these guys and girls that are out there on the, on the um, grounds right now. And they've got these radio transmitters out there tracking the birds and keeping track of their movements. And they'll be doing that right through until Christmas. So at the moment, we've got some fantastic results. We're not aware of any deceased birds. We have got some birds that have, have spread their wings and gone a bit further than you know we were expecting. And we're sort of chasing them around the landscape, trying to sort of see where they've gone. Um, so, so maybe I would really like everybody that's watching, if you know, you've got Regent Honey Eater Habitat around you, to just keep your eyes and ears out. We've even had some birds that, that from last year's release that came into bird baths around the Millfield area. Um, so if you're around Quarrelbelong, Pelton, um, all through Curry Cessnock, east over to the Sugarloaf Ranges and, and right up north to around Broken Singleton, just keep an eye out for these birds because there could be some that are out there in the landscape and they'll be feeding on our ironbark and long flowered mistletoe at the moment. So please keep your eyes and ears peeled and on the next slide I'll just show you um, yeah, what you can do to actually give us a hand if you've seen one. So if you think you've seen one, um, on that little photo there it's showing the bird's legs and the, and the colour band combination. So if you can get a photo that would be fantastic. A photo is probably one of the best ways that we can, we can confidently tell that it's a Regent Honey Eater and we may be able to tell what the leg band combinations are and we can work out exactly what bird we've got there. Just take down some notes. Um, what was it? what behaviour, what other species was it, it was with, and a date and a time would be really useful. And then there's some contact details there, a free call number, and then um, my boss, our, our Woodland Bird Program Manager, Dean Inguison, he is um, the one to go and, and tell and report your sightings to, and we'll make sure that we follow it up. And if you need any other information about Regent Honey Eaters and Woodland Birds, please visit our website, which is just there. And thank you for doing everything that you are doing to help woodland birds. And I wish you very well with your revegetation projects. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Christy. Um, I'd like to introduce now our guest speakers, David Carr and Paul Mullane, who are revegetation experts from Stringy Bark Ecological. David has worked for Greening Australia, Landcare, and a consultant as a consultant for the last 30 years. And he's a specialist in ecological restoration farm forestry and bushland management. Paul is a botanist and ecologist based in the Hunter Valley. He's also the upper Hunter land care officer and has extensive experience in working on revegetation projects. So over to you lads. Thank you. Thanks Carolyn uh, <clears throat> and welcome everybody to this uh, webinar. We <clears throat> would much rather have uh, be face to face with everybody and be speaking to you in a hall. Uh, we've run a few of these workshops in uh, the Wollombi area and in the Upper Hunter. And we would uh, <clears throat> normally run this as a whole day where we can get out in the open and uh, uh, go and look at some tree planting and we can get feedback from you and ask lots of questions as we go, but uh, we'll make the most of this now. So what we're, <clears throat> what we're going to do today is uh, talk about the preparation for a revegetation project. Now in the Hunter region, uh, autumn is a good time to do your planting. And Paul will go into why later. But now is the time to get ready for your revegetation project. You need, the, longest, the longer the time you have to prepare, the better results you will get. So we're focusing on uh, planting uh, today using seedlings. There are other methods you can use, including uh, assisted natural regeneration and direct seeding, but that's, a, that's for another day. So we're just going to talk today about how to give you, um, uh, how to get you ready for reveg. Now, because we're not face to face, we've included a few videos that we've made today just to mix it up. So you're not just listening to, to me drone on all day. Uh, and we've aimed this workshop at uh, uh, people on uh, small to medium size properties who are looking to do a, uh, a revegetation project up to about a hectare. So we'll move on. 
So firstly, we're going to talk a little bit about what are, what is involved in a revegetation project and some of the terms. So we use the word revegetation to talk about planting seeds or seedlings or assisting the regeneration of trees, shrubs, grasses, forbs, any other plants that you want to get onto your land. And usually we're creating new plant communities, whether they're artificial plant communities or whether we're trying to recreate pre-existing communities. When we get into revegetating the whole ecosystem, we talk about ecosystem restoration. And you may have heard that term uh, in relation to the, uh, to the United Nations um, millennial uh, uh, goals, sustainability goals. So ecosystem restoration is putting the whole vegetation and ecological community back. The other terms you might hear with revegetation is in relation to, for example, mine site rehabilitation, where we're trying to stabilise the land or repair damage to the land uh, and create a, a stable ongoing uh, ecosystem there. But for today, we're going to talk about revegetation as putting plants back into a farm environment for a number of reasons. Now, there's a couple of stages of a uh, revegetation project when you're planning a revegetation project. The first stage is to, is to understand your site and to know uh, what you're dealing with, what are the conditions that you're already working with. Uh, and the second component is then designing your revegetation project to fit your personal goals and needs on your land. And we'll get to design in a minute. But first, we're going to talk about uh, understanding the environment that you're working with and how that influences uh, how you prepare and carry out your revegetation project. Uh, Paul, I'll introduce Paul now. Paul's going to talk about uh, looking at the vegetation structure. Over to you, Paul. Okay, thanks, Dave. Um, yeah, before I forget, um, I've been asked to remind people that uh, yeah, when you do when you do so sort of plan your, um, your your vegetation works, um, ask yourself: Do you actually really need to do it? Um, in a lot of cases, um, from the vegetation you've already got on site. Um, you, may just, you may just need to do a bit of weed control and allow natural regeneration to um, to, to, to do its thing. Um, a lot of cases, people get sort of a bit carried away and want to want to go planting everything, um, but sometimes it's not necessary. Uh, we'll probably probably cover that a bit bit further as we go along, but um, I figure I'd better put that in right now because I'm bound to forget it as we go. Um, okay, so you work walk on the site. Um, first thing you need to do is actually try to figure out what sort of um, what sort of vegetation community you, you're dealing with. Um, now, a couple of reasons for that means so that once you once you know your vegetation community, you can actually understand whether or not you need to um, you need to actually get permission um, under the um, Biodiversity Conservation Act um, to do work in there because it could be a, it could be a threatened community. Um, and also, once you know the community, you can actually just start doing some research and um, Try to find out what um, what species naturally occur there. Um, in some cases, pretty easy pretty easy to tell whether it's a whether it's a forest or woodland, and so what community it is. Other sites you go to, um, you'll walk on walk on there, and there'll be pretty much one or two big trees and nothing else. Um, but those big trees can actually can help you out considerably um, as far as um, as far as veg communities is concerned, um, I tend to walk on the site, look for the look for the biggest biggest tree present, biggest tree present, um, look at the shape of it, try to figure out what it is, and that tells me a couple of very very important things. Certainly from the shape of a tree, um, whether it's in a whether it's in a, in a big V shape, um, if it's in a big V shape, uh, it's generally something which is growing up in the forest. Um, whereas if it's got the big round spreading head. Uh, it's generally grown up in, as woodland, um, so that that gives us a first first two first split down. So forest versus woodland, and of course, if we can identify the actual tree itself, it can help us break down um, break down and so find figure out which community it is supposed to um, it's supposed to be part of. Um, so other things you need to do, obviously, 
once you once you know the community, you know which plants which plants you need to need to put in. Uh, you need to look at spacing spacing between your plants, as as mentioned certainly in the with you with eucalypts in a woodland situation. They don't like they don't like sort of touching their canopies, so you spread the spread the trees out, and um, you also want to actually have a have a look and see what's what's present in on your site and what's absent. Um, in the in the in the picture we um, we've got there at the moment, um, there's a lot of trees, a lot of trees present. Um, so you probably think to yourself, well, plenty of trees. Do I actually need to plant trees in this situation? You'd um, you'd be looking more at um, more at mid-story and understory species. Um, so talking just a general general rundown on some of the veg um, veg formations we have in the Hunter. Um, I think pretty much except for um, tropical rainforest, we pretty well have them all. Um, so there's grassy woodlands, dry and wet sclerophyll forest. Um, there's uh, uh, forested wetlands, rainforests, and a whole heap of whole heap of variations in all of that. Uh, can we run to the next slide, Dave? You got that, Dave? Oh, there we go. Um, okay, so we want to look at the existing condition of what's on what's on site. Um, in many cases, particularly in the Hunter, um, and certainly plenty of others, um, we'll have a have a few um, few overstory species left, and we may or may not have a decent ground ground cover. Um, certainly, um, good good ground cover is is usually fairly present in the Upper Hunter, in the Lower Hunter, and um, and down on the coast. Uh, there's usually a lot of um, a lot of grassy weeds and other other weeds in the in the understory, but certainly the better the better the um, the ground layer ground layer cover is, the less you want to less you want to disturb it. Um, so uh, let me just have a have a quick look at my notes there. Obviously, you know, you'll need to check with local land services, particularly if you do have a um, do have endangered species or endangered community on the site, um, but yeah, so you need to need to figure out what you've got, what what you want to what you want to have, and as I mentioned mentioned earlier, do you actually really need to um, do you really need to, um, to to actually plant anything? In many cases, more a case of control the weeds, um, get rid of the lantana and blackberries and whichever other weeds, and a lot of your natives will um, can will ge regenerate themselves. And I think I'll hand it over to you now, Dave. Uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, so. Yes, it's important just to look at what's already there and think about uh, if you particularly if you're doing a conservation type project, there's no use planting a lot of shrubs into a grassy woodland because you're actually uh, making it worse um, and you you uh, you're altering the uh, the natural uh, ecological community that may be in good condition. So if you're in doubt about any of that, uh, LLS is your first starting point to get some advice. Okay, so you've looked at the vegetation. You know that what you what you're going to plant. You've had a look at the weeds that are there as part of the vegetation. I recommend you doing a soil test. It's always good to understand your soil, um, particularly because it helps you decide what species you're going to plant. It helps you decide uh, what uh, preparation you need to do, and it also helps you understand how much water your soil will will take. Now, the first thing we do is we, we look at uh, field texture. Uh, now, we've got a video. Uh, Kath, can we show that video, please? When you're planning a revegetation project, it's important to know your soil texture. Understanding your soil texture helps you determine what species to use and how to prepare the ground. Clear away the grass and collect a sample from the topsoil. You can also take a subsoil sample at 40 centimetres deep. It's a good idea to take three or four tests across your site to get a good indication of overall soil texture. To form your bolus, take a handful of soil and press it into a ball. Add a bit of water to moisten it and work it into a consistent texture. Have a feel for grittiness, stickiness and silkiness. Next, we'll do the ribbon test. Squeeze the bolus through your thumb and forefinger to form the soil into a ribbon. The length of the ribbon will help the classification of the soil. This sample here is quite sticky and forms a long ribbon. 
A field handbook or a similar resource will take you through the different soil textures. Going by this one, I think this is a medium clay. As you can see, it's quite sticky and forms a good ribbon. Thank you, Keth. Uh, so a clay soil will require, uh, probably require you to break it up a little bit. And we do that uh, with a number of techniques. Uh, clay soils are a bit harder to get, um, get your tools into for planting. They're also a bit harder to, uh, uh, for water to soak in. But once the water's in there, it tends to stay there a lot longer. Sandy soils, very easy to plant into. Don't require much preparation, but this, the water drains away fairly quickly. Uh, the second thing we look at is colour. The, as a rule of thumb, the darker the, the soil colour, the more nutrients it's holding. Uh, so very, very light coloured soils, like the one in this picture here, uh, will have less nutrients than very dark black or brown uh, soils. So that just sort of tells you, uh, mainly in relation to weeds, the, the more nutritious soils will hold a much greater variety and biomass of weeds. So you're going to have to do a bit more on your weed control. Uh, the next one is, uh, is pH. Uh, this tells you how acid or alkaline your soil is and tell, tells you what, uh, uh, whether you may have to modify your soil before um, doing your reveg project. So get another video there, Kath, please. <laughs> Okay, so that just shows you how to do a pH test with a very basic kit you can get from just about any garden center or hardware shop. And generally we like to work within a range of about six or se six to seven pH, but um, some soils uh, are quite alkaline. Um, there are parts of the Hunter Valley where you get soils with limestone where the alkalinity will be quite high. And other areas that have been used for, uh, for cropping often have a, a very acid surface soil. So generally, if it's a really high pH or a low pH, you'd want to be very careful about the species that you choose. And if it's on a small enough scale, you may be able to modify that by adding something like lime to correct acidity. Uh, but on a big scale, it's usually um, better just to uh, choose your species uh, correctly. And we, we suggest looking at both your surface and your subsoil, getting down to about 40 centimetres deep for that and doing a few samples across your revegetation site. Okay, so you've worked out where your, uh, your, what your soil is, you know what your vegetation is. Now you need to look at some other factors uh, on your site, such as uh, water, wind and, and slope. And these things help you decide, again, what species to select um, how you're going to prepare your site and what issues you might have in the future. So water is a classic one. So you can have too much or too little water on your reveg site. Too much can be, uh, for example, swampy ground or areas where water will run on uh, when it's been raining a lot. So, you know, temporary swamps, those sorts of things. And so that soil can be quite waterlogged at different times or water can sit there for sometimes months, depending on where you are. 
Uh, too little water is usually the problem where you've got soils that are uh, that don't soak up water very re readily, so steep country, uh, the tops of ridges, or areas with hydrophobic soils. That means that they repel water. Uh, and you, can, you may have to use something like a water, uh, uh, a water crystal to get water to soak into those sort of soils. So watch, watch your revegetation uh, site in, uh, in wet times uh, when it's been raining a lot and just see where the water sits. And then you may have to think about using slightly different species in those very wet areas compared to your dry areas. Uh, the other thing we look at with, with slope is that cold air moves like, um, like water. Uh, it flows downhill and accumulates in, in low parts of the landscape, such as river flats and, and valley floors. Uh, so if you're up in the uh, upper parts of the Hunter Valley where frost is a real problem, uh, in the Barringtons, that sort of area, uh, you may have a, a, a difference in temperature of up to 10 degrees between the floor of a valley and the top of an adjacent slope. So you really need to be very careful about uh, picking your species that can be frost tolerant. Aspect is sort of the opposite. Aspect is which way the slope faces. So a slope that's facing due north will get a lot more sun and heat than a, than a slope that will face south. And often you'll see in the bush, uh, areas on the north side will have open eucalypt woodland and on the south side of a hill, they'll have rainforest or a similar uh, environment. Uh, wind can be a problem um, and it's something you may want to look at if you're looking to block wind uh, to your property, you might be wanting to protect your house or uh, protect livestock or pastures or even crops. Uh, so you need to know where, where most of your wind comes from and how strong it is. So uh, at the moment, we're getting a lot of cold winds coming from the southwest. But you also know where your problem winds come from. So that may be the cold, wet winds that come in winter, or it may be hot summer winds, and they often come from different directions. So that might help design where you're going to put your, your, your plantings and, and, and how thick those, uh, those plantings might be. Okay, so you're armed with that information about your site. You've got a pretty good idea of what, uh, what's the environment that you're going to be doing your revegetation project in. And if you're not sure what to do with that information, at least you've got the information, you can go and ask some sensible questions for some people. The next thing to look at is why you're doing the, the planting and how do you design that project to achieve your goals. Uh, so we've looked at you know, what site you're working with. Now we're going to look at, uh, at your motivations for doing it. So when we get into uh, uh, design, you've got control over a number of things. Uh, you, can, you can look at the shape of your revegetation project. So shelter belts and wildlife corridors are often long and narrow. Um, wildlife habitat plantings are often in blocks. And if you're just doing shade plantings, it might just be single trees scattered throughout your paddock. You can choose the right species. You can choose species that suit your, your, uh, your goals. Uh, as we've discussed a little bit, the density of your planting uh, will have a big factor in what it looks like. So if you're in a forest area, you are planting your trees much closer together than if you're in a woodland. And we'll talk about density in a bit more detail in a sec. Uh, you can choose where you put it. Is it on the boundary? Is it near the house? Is it around your sheds? Is it the whole property? Uh, when we talk about structure, that's sort of the mix between the different species. So. Uh, how, how many trees, how many shrubs, how many grasses? Are you going to have open areas, uh, very dense areas? What's going to be the, the balance between those? And then finally, what's the management that you're going to do? Um, am I just doing a one-off uh, plant and forget, or am I going to come back and manage this, this site uh, in the future? And when we talk about density, this means the distance between the trees that we're planting. And often we'll plant in rows, particularly for trees and shrubs. So this table shows you the distance between your rows in this column and the distance between the plants in your rows in the next column. 
So you might, uh, for example, put your rows uh, three metres apart and then you, within those rows you're planting your trees uh, three metres apart. And that tells you in this column how many trees or plants per hectare you're going to, going to look at. So these very dense plantings at the top here uh, where your rows are only half a metre apart and your distance between plants is half a metre apart, that yields 40,000 seedlings per hectare, which gets expensive. But we use that sometimes in riparian areas because that very dense planting captures the, it blocks out all the sunlight and means that the weeds, which are really prevalent in riparian areas, can't get started. So sometimes we use that for urban riparian projects. Um, we, then we get up into lower densities where this, this area here where we're looking at three by three up to say four by five metres is your typical sort of farm shelter belt sort of plantings where you've got um, uh, either, you know, forestry or high rainfall uh, areas or, you know, wider spacings in low rainfall areas so that the trees don't, aren't so uh, stuck for, for water. Uh, if you've got a, a choice, you would put your rows further apart rather than your plants because the rows are usually prepared with machinery and the fewer rows you've got, the less cost there is for, for preparing those rows. Uh, sometimes we get up into these very sparse plantings like 200 seedlings per hectare where we're, we're using direct seeding and we're just putting some seedlings in. Or we may get right up into these very sparse ones where we're planting individual trees at wide spacings through the paddock for, uh, for shelter uh, or shade for stock, or just to create that really open woodland that allows uh, animals like koalas uh, or some of our woodland birds to just move through the landscape. One of the most common reasons people plant trees on farms is for shelter, either shelter for livestock, pastures or crops, or shelter for people around their houses or, or sheds or even driveways. And one of the common designs is to put, uh, say, four or five rows of trees and shrubs um, about 15 metres wide along a boundary fence between paddocks. We align these rows perpendicular to the prevailing wind that we're trying to block. So in this diagram here, the wind would be coming from the top or the bottom. And as a rule of thumb, we use uh, a lot more shrubs than we use trees in this. Trees will give you high shelter, but if you don't mix them with shrubs, you'll end up with uh, gaps underneath the tree canopy and you'll make the wind problem worse. Uh, and another rule of thumb that we use is to place your shelter belts 10 to 15 tree heights apart. So if your shelter belt is using trees that grow to about 20 metres high, then you would put that 200 to 300 metres apart. And what that does is it, uh, it blocks the wind or slows down the energy of the wind. And then by the time the wind's picking up again, you've got another shelter belt there. And so in between those shelter belts, the wind speed is much lower. So your plants and, and your animals are protected from that, that wind. And there's very good research and evidence to show that you get very good production benefits from doing this sort of uh, shelter arrangement. Alternatively, you can use these mid paddock shelter clumps. So here's a circular clump planted in the upper hunter there. And these trees are planted in circles and you can go as big or as small as you like. And that way that whatever the direction the wind is coming from, um, you, the, your stock can get behind the wind and uh, behind the shelter belt and get out of the wind. Uh, this is also good for uh, uh, allowing wildlife to sort of hop across open areas. They just get that little bit of rest in a sheltered area before they have to hop over to the next clump of, of trees. Okay. Uh, another really common reason and uh, this is relevant in relation to what we're talking about today with the region honey eaters and other endangered woodland birds. A lot of people want to plant wildlife corridors. And generally, 
we use corridors to connect two existing patches of bushland. Now, you have to be very careful with these that you make them wide enough and not too long. Otherwise, you draw animals out of the safety of those bushland patches, out into areas where they're vulnerable to predation by cats and foxes or raptors or getting stressed from lack of food or, or water. So another rule of thumb is really, they should be about 25 metres wide and preferably up to 100 metres wide. A kilometre is ideal, but maximum of two kilometres. And at that one or two kilometre point, there should be another large patch of bushland. An alternative can be to put clumps of trees less than 100 metres apart. There's a lot of little birds that can cross a gap of about 100 metres, but they won't, they won't cross much more than that. So you can either use these linear corridors or the scattered stepping stone idea for wildlife corridors. But again, understand the wildlife that you're trying to help move through the landscape. Koalas, for example, will just, they'll happily move through scattered paddock trees. You don't have to have these wide corridors, but they do like to be able to run up a tree if they're being chased by a dog or by a mob of cattle. So again, talk to uh, LLS or Bird, BirdLife Australia to understand the species that you're trying to cater towards. Now, uh, complementary to wildlife corridors is habitat plantings. Now, this is to create habitat for particular birds and you can create them from scratch or you can add to existing bushland. So an area of about 10 hectares will support um, a lot of these woodland birds and animals uh, better than, you know, really isolated uh, trees and, and shrubs around the place. So 10 hectares is a pretty good goal. You may want to, uh, you know, go in with your neighbours in order to get that, um, that size of planting. Um, look at your local vegetation structure and try and replicate that if you can. Uh, in this case, it's really good to include tussock grasses, some of your big grasses, and let them go to seed because there's a lot of little birds like finches that uh, decline because they just can't get access to grass seed. And of course, you can add habitat features such as uh, nest boxes um, and water. And you can either use existing water or you can add artificial water. Another really common method of uh, uh, reason for revegetation is to control erosion. Uh, uh, an erosion such as in this picture, uh, you're probably going to need some mechanical work as well, but in most cases, uh, vegetation is your best control and prevention for soil erosion. You, uh, we use trees as the framework for holding soil together, but we tend to use uh, rushes, grasses and bendy shrubs to protect the surface of the soil and stop the mobilisation of the soil first. In this sort of creek planting, we would be planting down here in the toe of the slope, in the toe of the bank there, and we'd be, what we're doing is then stopping the energy of flowing water from undermining this, this uh, bank here. And you can also use flexible shrubs like tea trees and bottle brushes which in a high flow will just lay down across the surface of the soil and protect it from erosion. And again, if you've got something like this on your place, go and see LLS and get some expert advice. Okay, so at this stage of your revegetation project, one of the important things you should be doing is choosing your uh, species you're going to plant. And again, that will be dictated by uh, you know, what you found out about your site, but also what your goals are. Uh, but I always suggest going and talking to other neighbours who've done reveg, talk to Landcare, talk to LLS, uh, talk to your local nurseries, and you'll get some good advice about um, species. We, we tend to, as a, as a first, um, first rule is we use local species because we know they're adapted to the local soils and community. And we, uh, we can go and look at those species in the bush and say, 
all right, I know how big that one's going to get. I know the sort of place that one grows. Um, you can also be sure that the local wildlife are adapted to those species. Um, again, plant what will grow. Make sure that you're planting things that are that are easy to grow um, and will survive with the management you're prepared to put in. A good example is a lot of people plant lots of little wildflowers and little grasses, but if you've got really rampant grass weed competition, uh, those little things are going to struggle to compete with those things. So if you're prepared to put in a lot of time uh, and effort, then planting those things is a good idea. If you're limited for resources, then perhaps just stick to trees and shrubs for your first one. Uh, you also need to look at whether there's has been or is going to be significant changes. So climate change is something we're just struggling to work out how to adapt uh, our, our revegetation uh, to future uh, climates. You know, some of these trees we plant might live for 600 years. So the climate in 600 years is likely to be very, very different to the climate now. So uh, for the moment, uh, look at uh, look at planting uh, really healthy plants uh, and collected, collect your seed from uh, areas that are probably a little bit hot, hotter and drier than the current environment. If you've got no idea, uh, firstly, I'd talk to your nursery or your land care, but you can use tools like this. This is a, a site called PlantNet, which is from the, um, the Botanic Gardens in Sydney. And you can choose, uh, uh, you can search by a predetermined area, you can put in a, a range of latitude and longitude, or you can put in the name of your town and then search within, say, a 25 kilometre radius. That will give you records of all the plants that have been collected within that particular area that are held at, that, at the herbarium in Sydney. So you look at the trees and you look at the shrubs and it'll give you an idea of what grows naturally in your area. Um, I recommend this sort of five to 10 kilometer search around your town or using this latitude and longitude box to give you a, a, a bit of an idea. But again, you know, look at some good books or, or, or talk to a local expert, uh, such as Paul Milan, who I'm going to hand over to now. And Paul's gonna take you through, through some of the techniques for getting your site prepared for a planting next autumn. Over to you, Paul. Okay, thanks, Dave. Um, wouldn't quite put myself in the expert category, um, mainly because people keep asking me silly questions. Um, yeah, obviously we want to want to do some um, do some preparation. We need you. Have we got the next slide there, Dave? We found it. It's okay. Yep, just a general timeline that we've got there. Um, one of the one of the things about growing plants is they can take um, can take so three to six months for a lot of the common plants to um, to, to grow from from seed to um, to planting size. Um, there's also a whole range of other plants which um, which will take up to up to a couple of years to germinate. So you really do need to think about these from sort of way way ahead. Um, and certainly, if you go to, if you go to your nursery, um, so a week be, a week before you're planting, and so sort of try to order up 800 plants um, to stick on stick on your property, you're probably not going to get much luck. Um, probably going to get things which are too small, um, not necessarily um, suited for your for your place, or they'll be all of the the ones which have been sort of stuck out the back, which have been waiting for someone to come along and buy for ages. Um, so what do we do? Obviously, we think think about things. You start planning, um, and obviously, yep, like I said, twelve months ahead. Um, planning. I mean, planning and prep. That's what we're main, mainly talking about today. Um, figure out what you're going to be, what you're going to be planting, how much you're going to be going to be um, going to be planting, um, who's going to be doing the planting. Um, you might need to might do this to organise your Organise your mates. I mean, so twelve months, uh, twelve months ahead, and to uh, start storing up the beer and uh, training the training the barbecue staff to um, to get things going. Um, you also, might, might want to look at seed collection. Uh, as I just mentioned, um, yeah, it can take a number of months to um, for the 
for your plants to grow, but it's also a case that um, if you go if you go talking to your nursery around about do February um, and start asking for a number of the um, number of the acacia species which have already dropped their seeds around about um, well around about now, so November December, um, they're really not going to have they they may not necessarily have those plants ready for next for next year because they don't have the seeds. Um, so obviously, if you're getting round about round about now or so late um, late spring, um, give you give your nursery plenty of um, plenty of advance warning uh, so they can go out and actually find the find the seeds. Um, in a lot of cases, um, they've probably got their got their range of, of plants which they which they've um, got in common, which you can commonly get. Um, but a lot of the less less common ones um, can take a, can take quite a while to um, to get hold of the seed. Um, and even to figure out how to germinate them, um, there are there's a whole range of whole range of different um, different germination triggers for a whole whole range of plants, and we still don't know so many of them. Um, okay, so we've got any, we've got any, got in order. We've got the um, told told the nursery that we want these seeds. Obviously, you've got to look at weed control, um, and weeds are probably one of the big um, big issues which are going to be going to be affecting your um, your re veg. Um, the, the earlier you get in with that, the better. Um, look at whether you need to whether you need to do some fencing. Um, you may whether it's going whether it's going to be permanent, whether it's going to be temporary, whether you're going to put some put some electric up or whatever. Um, yeah, your fencing fencing can um, can stop the can stop a few of the browsers coming in and can also sort of stop people from just sort of driving across the site. It, it gives you gives you a bit of ownership and control of of the site you're going to going to have. So that's 12 months. That's 12 months ahead. Six months. Six months time. Just review it. Um, okay. I mean, so you've got you've got your plan. You're sticking sticking up on the beer fridge. So every time you go and grab yourself a beer, have a look at the fridge. Have a look at the plan. Right. Okay. It's all going to work. Do I need to do I need to do a do a, um, do a weed control follow up? And certainly about six months out, you really want to start thinking about doing some ripping. And of course, check with your nursery, see if they've gotten the, see if they've managed to get the seeds, see if they've managed to germinate them, and see whether or not they're going to be um, going to be growing by by that stage. Um, obviously, the earlier the earlier you check up on these, and the more regular, um, the more you can prepare just in case things do go do go wrong, which they probably will at some stage. Um, you also want to, as as Dave mentioned, um, you want to look at the local. Um, Local, well, sorry, just lost my lost my train of thought for a second. Um, yeah, so work out work our way through. Three months down, check again, check progress, check weeds, and a month a month out, um, you, a month out, everything should be everything should be ready to go. Um, your site should be prepped. Weeds should be weeds should be under control. You should have the the, the nursery should have the plants ready. All your equipment, all your all your workers are available and functioning, and you'd be ready to go. Um, as we mentioned, you can um, certainly if the nursery is going to, not going to um, not going to have the plants or can't, you can always grow them grow them yourself. Let me just check on something here for a second. Okay, um, so we're we're going to look at um, look at ordering ordering the plants. Um, Dave's already done a video on this, so he can actually um, tell you what plants are what plants are going to look like. But just to give yourself a bit of bit of information, give yourself plenty of plenty of time. Make sure the seeds are nice and healthy, and we'll just sort of tick, kick over to the video now. Just going to look at how some different seedlings are grown and the different type of seedlings you can use for your revegetation project. These ones here are called Heiko trays. You'll see that there's 40 cells in a tray and they're used for growing farm trees. A planter, when they're taking these trees out to plant them, can carry 40 trees on their belt or 80 trees and they can pull the trees out and plant them as they go. The big advantage of these seedlings is the way they train the roots and they train the roots so that they don't spiral around 
and that they're air pruned so they don't grow beyond the bottom of the container and so there's all these growing points here that are ready to grow out as soon as they get put into the ground. When you buy seedlings what you're looking for is those healthy roots and not having the seedling having the roots going round and round in a circle there. The other thing that you're looking for is the ratio of the shoot to the root should be no more than about four times. So the shoot should be no more than four times as big as that root ball. Ideally about two to three times. So this one here is about twice as big and there's others here that are, that are two or three times as big. And that means that the root ball can support that shoot when it's planted out into the paddock. That's the length of the root ball there. It's about one, two, three times as high as, as the root, root ball. So that's a really good, healthy seedling, nice, healthy roots. That'll go really well when you plant it out. The other type of seedling that's really common, and particularly in the Hunter area, is what they call a tube. Uh, they come in different sizes. So this is called tube stock. Uh, and again, this is just a small container. And again, you got nice health, healthy root development. You can see some lines here where the, uh, there's barriers in the pot to stop the roots spiraling around and around. So that's quite a healthy root system on that one there. And you can see that the, the, the root to shoot ratio the, the roots are the shoots about twice as big as the root, so that's a really good, um, healthy seedling to grow. The way to get these out of the pot: put your hands on the top of the mix and just give it a bit of a tap to loosen it, and then it'll come off very easily. Now this type of seedling is what we call a thumb pot. It's much smaller than the tube but it's often used for grasses or for wildflowers. And these, again, uh, have a root pruning system built into them. And to get these out, we give them a squeeze. And you can see there's a mass of roots in there, but you can clearly see these lines where the barriers inside the pot prevent the roots from spiraling around. So the last thing you want is roots that are spiraling around because the plant can strangle itself. So you can see there, there's some really healthy roots there. All these air pruned root tips are ready to just grow as soon as you put that into the ground. Okay. Um, yeah, as we said, um, yep, plenty, allow plenty of time. Um, certainly, you can, um, if you are ordering up, ordering up seeds, you can ordering up plants. You can supply, supply your own seed. Um, certainly, at the moment, the um, a lot of the, um, a lot of the acacias are ripening, are ripening up, um, and so yeah, they're good for maybe they're good to um, to supply the nursery with. Certainly, if you're going to supply the nursery with seed, make sure you've you've got enough seed there for them to to be able to supply enough plants for you. Um, generally, you, you know, you're very rarely going to get 100% germination, so you're going to need to put more plants, more seeds in than what you're going to um, going to be getting back. Um, specify the specify your container type, um, whether you're going to be using tube stock or or hycos, or whether it's going to be in the pot, which we don't, or larger pot, which we do generally don't um, don't use for a lot of these make sure you be prepared for it to put down the post the deposit because um, these things can can cost the nursery a lot of time and money to get get going or alternatively you can think about growing your own um, and that's a quite a quite an easy quite an easy thing to do the important thing to do is if you are collecting from your own site um, make sure you're actually identifying um, the, the plants which you're going to be going to be um, using um, because yeah, if you're going to be, if you take the wrong plant in um, and they grow more of them, yeah, it may not be a, may not be a good idea. Um, certainly, if you can't if you can't identify it, try to take in a sample of the plant into the nursery while while you, when you take the seeds in, so they should be able to they should be able to identify it then and make sure you take plenty of photos of the actual plant. 
Okay, so going to be looking at ground prep next. Um, yeah, obviously we've 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 planned we've planned ahead. We've got they've got the plants under control. We've got them got them more than that happening. So how do we go? How and why do we go about um, about ground preparation? Probably the um, the big things as to why. Um, obviously, it increased as you can see increases increases water infiltration, aerates the soil, improves root root spread. Um, stim trouble is it does actually stimulate weed growth, which is a good thing because it means you can actually kill the killer plants or it means you can kill the weeds. So deep ripping is one of the most common um, common sort of preparations which we use for, for larger farm plantings. Um, so it's generally done with a single single tine um, single tine ripper, which breaks the soil down to about sort of three to six hundred mil. Um, so what that does breaks up any cultivation plan, pans or, um, or or hard compaction which you've gotten from stock, um, and allows a, allows the water to penetrate in the soil. So because you've and hopefully at the same time you've you've killed your weeds as well. It allows the water to, pen, to penetrate in the soil, and over that sort of six six to twelve months or so, you build up your soil water supply. Um, so there's actually moisture moisture down in the soil to um, for next time. Um, as you said, ripping should be carried out at least three months, if not if not six months beforehand. Um, allows the soil to settle and and allows the moisture to build up. Now, one of the issues is in cracking clay soils or anything with a very high clay content. Um, you can actually get um, you, you you can sort of basically glaze the sides of the of the rip line, um, so you, you the sides basically end up with just a nice long straight line in there. Um, the sides are nice and glazed, and the roots they won't actually penetrate. Um, so what you need to do is run over run over the um, over the line to a couple of couple of times with the ripper, um, just allow things to allow things to break up. Um, let me just. Check my notes here. Um, video there, Paul. We've we do have video, so we're going to we're going to look at um, at ground prep. Okay, so um, ripping's ripping's a great method of um, of ground preparation, but there are a couple of um, are a couple of issues with ripping. Um, certainly, if you in in erodible in erodible soils, uh, if you um, if you run the rip line for, for too long, it can create um, can create erosion gullies, and certainly along um, along riparian areas, it can be can be a problem as well. Um, there's two ways, a couple of ways of dealing with it. Um, first is to do short short rip lines. Or alternatively, you can actually look at augering. Um, so I'm going to have the auger slide, Dave. Sorry, I might just go to the video. I've just lost control of the thing for a sec. <laughs> Not a problem.
Um, as we said, yeah, that's one one auger, one one type of auger. Um, as you can see, the wood, the um, the soil fell straight back down into the hole, so it's absolutely no good for for post hole digging that particular one. Um, but yeah, we also have the handheld handheld augers, um, which is something similar to um, to a, to a um, to a post hole digger. Um, they're quite good for putting putting holes in. The only issue is um, certainly in a um, in a clay soil, they can bore. They can um, they can sort of glaze up can glaze up the bore, um, so you may need to um, may need to sort of stick a um, crowbar or something down the side just to break up the um, break up the in, the inside of the of the of the hole. And can we go to our? I think we've got the weeds weeds now, Dave. Okay, we've talked a lot about weeds. Um, I mean, base to to put it bluntly, I mean, so weeds three double or four W's of um, of of um, planting failures, basic weeds, weeds, water, wombats, um, and um, and sort of wrong wrong planting methods. So weeds are weeds are a huge issue. Um, they take the um, they compete for water, they compete for nutrients, they compete for sunlight. Um, and and sorry. Um, so we're not just we're not just talking about so about your about your farm weeds and thistle, like thistles and burrs. They can be anything which is in there. Certainly grasses, grasses, native plants, anything. Um, and so you put your plant in, and it's got a tiny little root ball with tiny little roots, and it's competing with something like like a big lump of paspalum, which is right next to it, which has got the roots out everywhere. The paspalum is going to going to dominate. Um, and certainly, if, if you've got your um, if you're putting in some of your eucalypts. And um, and the grasses are grasses are growing up and and compete and pushing in the head of the, euc of the eucalypt, the eucalypt will be stunted. So obviously we need to look a bit look at weeds. So whether you whether you use um, use mechanical means or, or chemical, um, yeah, it's up to it's up to you. But certainly chemical is easier. But it but it does it brings in brings on its own issues. But as does as does mechanical. Um, riparian areas have usually got a got years supply of um, of weeds there, um, so it's going to require so multiple multiple treatments both before and after your plantings. Um, probably one of the um, one of the ones that to really look about are weed uh, grassy weeds. Can we just have the grass weeds on, Dave. Uh, we got the video sorry. on the got backpack the video. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Getting ahead of myself. Sorry, Dave. We want the video now. Yes, thanks. When you're preparing for a, a tree planting project or a revegetation project, it's important that the trees go in into a weed-free environment. So we need to do weed control at least uh, three months and probably one month before you're ready to plant. What that does is it allows the soil to take up the moisture and it means that your young seedlings aren't competing for moisture with established grasses. So we're going to use just an ordinary backpack spray. This is commonly available in your hardware shop. This is a 15 litre backpack spray. It'll do enough for a couple of hundred trees. If you don't want to use herbicides, there's other ways to do it, but this is how we do herbicides. First thing we're going to do is add some water to the backpack spray. I'm just going to put five litres in. You can see there we've got five litres of water in there now. We're using glyphosate, which is a really common herbicide that'll kill grasses and a lot of plants. And glyphosate or any herbicide or any chemical to use you have to read the label and you have to use it according to the label. Very important that you read the label and only use it where it's licensed to be able to be used. Glyphosate we're using at the rate of 15 mils per litre of water. So for that five litres, I've got 75 mils of glyphosate here. And I'm just going to use gloves so I don't get it on my hands. Depending on the chemical you're using, you may have to use more protective equipment like uh, full body suits or masks, but glyphosate, I'd just wear some gloves. So we just pour that in, put the lid back on, 
and then I just give that a bit of a shake just to mix it through. So, all with the backpack. And then we're ready to go. So we're going to spray an area about a metre in diameter. And we just want to wet the foliage. You don't want to saturate it. And that'll kill that grass off fairly quickly. Back to you, Paul. Back to me. Thanks, Dave. Um, yeah, probably one of the um, one, one, of, one of the big sort of weed weed groups which we um, which we have to deal with most of your um, your grassy grassy plants, particularly ones which um, which grow from runners. So your, your stolons and rhizomes. So you're looking at things like kaikuyu, cooch, carpet grass, um, and they will actually sort of quite often quite often dominate dominate the area. Uh, as we can see from the photo, photo there is a lot of um, a lot of kaikuyu in there. And there are a few plants hiding in amongst the um, the, the kike. Um, kike in that situation is probably about 50 centimetres high and really, really thick. Um, so obviously grass grasses are, are a big issue. Um, if you're using herbicides, you're probably going to need to need to do a few follow-ups, try and try and keep them under under control, and make sure all of all the runners are killed. Um, and follow-up sprays are going to be going to be needed. Try to try to kill kill that off. Um, you can also try smothering them with carpet, carpet, plastic, cardboard. Um, one of the, um, or you could also try um, try doing a bit of scraping, um, which needs a bit of heavy heavy equipment. So you put a um, put a grader uh, grader blade down, and actually take the whole take the whole surface off. Um, but again, that's yeah, you really want to consider that. Um, Another thing you might want to consider is actually sort of is stage is stage your stage your plantings by putting in um, putting some some fast growing pioneer species. Um, so a lot of the wattles will grow will grow quite um, quite quickly. Um, and um, or alternatively, being a being a rainforest, there's a there's a number of rainforest plants um, which can which can can grow quite quite quickly, which do which do cover um, which will shade them out. One of the things which um, which Kaikuyu doesn't like. Um, doesn't like doesn't like shade, and also stops growing in winter. So it gives you a bit of bit of um, bit of options there. Okay, so we've done all that. We've thought about thought about sort of weed controls and plantings, all kind of stuff. And we've got to look at fencing. Um, so fences are designed to keep things both in and out, um, and they're going to going to depend on what you what you're trying to trying to keep out. Uh, if it's just a general Horses, horses and livestock. You can probably get away with it. Get away with a sort of yeah, with a um, simple, simple barbed wire fence. If you've got um, if you've got uh, uh, kangaroos and various other animals which come through, you'll probably want to look at um, look at something with a bit of um, look at this sort of hinge joint type type fence. Um, so obviously, the the bigger basically the bigger the bigger the animal you're trying to keep out, the more sturdy your fence you're going to need. Um, and obviously, you might might want to just put up some electric fence, electric fence temporarily, um, till your plants till your plants are up. I think we're start running so pretty well, so short on short on time, or just about on on time there. Um, so we can talk for ages on on fencing, but we won't. Um, probably just to give some acknowledgements. Got to thank thanks to Hunter, Land, Hunter Local Land Services um, for actually. Um, Giving giving Dave and I the opportunity to um, to to put this together over the past um, past 12 months or so. Um, this is the first time we've run it through as a as a webinar.